Hey, welcome to trucks. You know, a few months ago, I pulled a 1941 Dodge military truck out of a field and pulled it in the shop here and got it running again. <laughs> All right. <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> Look at this. No power steering, <laughs> no brakes, <laughs> no floor. But it's running under its own power, and that is what trucks is all about. This is great. <laughs> and after building a new floor for it, I teased you with some really big tires. I have got plans for this thing. Big plans. Really big plans. Bigger than you can imagine. Now that Copperhead's almost done, it's time to start building a big, bad off-road truck which means it's time to get that old power wagon back in here. And I'm gonna call it Sergeant Rock. Now, the reason I'm doing that is not just to recognize its obvious World War II heritage. <laughs> no, it's also to pay tribute to one of the most famous fighting machines of World War II, the Memphis Bell. Now, I'm sorry to say that a lot of you are probably thinking, the Memphis Bell? What the heck is that? And why is that worthy of a tribute? And that's okay, it was a long time ago. But some things should not be forgotten. So we are gonna give everybody a little reminder. The Memphis Bell was a bomber, but not just any bomber. It was a B-17 Flying Fortress. Now the B-17 had one purpose, to drop bombs on Germany. and hopefully bring their crews back alive, day after day, mission after mission. But it wasn't that easy. Despite its toughness, the B-17s took incredible casualties, to the point where the U.S. government said, if a plane could survive 25 missions, it and its crew could go home. And the Memphis Belle was the first B-17 to do that, making it and her crew bona fide war heroes. But to truly understand what these crews and these airplanes went through and why this is such a big deal, well, you'd really need to ride on the Memphis Belle back in 43 on an actual bombing mission. So let's go. The first thing that you had to contend with was the flak and the fighters. They pounded at you from the ground and from the air, and they could easily turn your airplane into Swiss cheese. After that, heck, making it through the bombing run was the easy part. The hard part was getting back home without getting shot down by enemy fighters. There's four of them, one o'clock high. They're coming around, watch. Two fighters, six o'clock up, coming in, diving out, Chief. There's two more diving through the 94. Three planes, nine o'clock, coming around. Keep your eye on the boy. Coming around the 10. Watch them, Chuck. Keep your eyes open. Yeah. They're breaking at 11. Breaking at 11. I got them. Yeah. Hey, coming around here. He's at 10 o'clock. I got those two at 2 o'clock. Watch them, Scotty. I got my sights on them. Check out B-17, Chuck. 3 o'clock. Motor smoking. Fire at 10.30. Coming around. Those 10.30 upper or lower? Uh, Keep after him, would you? I see him. I'm on him. Come on, you son of a bitch. I got him. Well, confirm that fighter. He got him, Chief. Look, he's bailing out. Damn it, don't yell on that intercom. Fighters, 10 o'clock. Watch those two at 12, Ben. They're coming in. They're coming in, Scotty. Get that ball turret on him. as much as possible. Watch that fighter coming in at 3 o'clock. He's coming in in a half roll. Pull her up, Chief. Pull her up. Hurry. B-17's 
17 out of control at 3 o'clock. Now, the intensity of the battle was bad enough, but there was also the horror of this. Come on, you guys, get out of that plane. Bail out. There's one. He come out of the bomb bay. Yeah, I see him. There's a tail gunner coming out. Watch out for fighters. Keep your eye on them, Bill. See any parachutes, Quinlan? Two parachutes. Two black at 9 o'clock. Eight men still in that B-17. Come on, the rest Christ of you guys. Get out of there. Come on, bail So far, there's three more shoots. Flag, 11 o'clock. One by one, the planes would straggle back, some without a scratch. Others shot up so bad, it's a miracle they stayed in the air. And for the crews, the story was the same. Some walked out without a scratch. Others were wounded, but rose again to fight another day. And some paid the ultimate price. And it was in the face of these harsh realities that the Memphis Belle flew her 25 successful missions to become a symbol over incredible odds for the whole nation. But the real question here is, where does an old battle-scarred airplane go once all the bullets have stopped flying and all the crews have gone home? Where did she end up after the war? Uh-uh, after the break. Hey, welcome back to Trucks. Today, I'm laying the groundwork for a killer off-road truck I'm gonna build called Sergeant Rock. I'm gonna utilize that old 41 Dodge sitting outside. And it's gonna be forever linked to the legendary bomber of World War II, the Memphis Bell. But before you can understand where I'm going with this truck project, you really need to understand the significance of that old airplane. That's what we're doing. Now, after the war, the Memphis Bell was retired and then it was put on display in Memphis, Tennessee, where it sat and it deteriorated. People just kind of forgot about it. But a few years ago, it was declared a national historic treasure by the government. And a nonprofit organization of volunteers decided it was time to restore the bell so future generations will be able to experience this piece of history. The association's purpose is to preserve uh, the Memphis Bell. In order to make this project work, you know, we need, uh, we need the country behind us. She belongs to the country and all our veterans. And uh, it's going to take, you know, money from all over the United States to make this happen. But what exactly is going to happen? Simple. A full-on restoration to return the bell to the shape it was in when it completed its last mission. Now, like I said before, everyone that works on the bell is a volunteer. No one's getting paid here. But all the lead guys in charge of the restoration are top flight professional aircraft mechanics. So you know this is going to be done right. The plane must be slowly and carefully disassembled so each major component can be worked on separately. And even though it's tough work, these guys don't forget to have fun. <laughs> Although the wings and tail are in surprisingly good shape, especially for a battle-scarred B-17, they're still gonna need a lot of work before this thing's ready for any museum. Number two tank fuel quantity indicator, or transmitter, goes to the indicator. Tells you how much gas you got. It's got an old float on it, which probably is still float. <laughs> Restoring the aluminum skin is a unique challenge. Where replacements are needed because of corrosion or vandalism, exact replicas are fabricated and carefully riveted into place. 
However, you got to be really careful on a project like this that you don't remove the history of the aircraft. This is flak damage where a flak shell went off and the uh, hot metal from the exploding shell came through the, that lower skin fairing mm -hmm. and penetrated the fuselage and it actually uh, set the, one of the radios on fire during that mission. People need to see this. This is actual battle damage from World War II and it, it would be actually be a, a travesty to, to even attempt to repair any of this stuff. This is history. Of course, the engine restoration room was one of my favorites because it was packed with those four huge Curtis Wright Cyclone engines that have about the coolest cylinders I've ever seen. Well, that may have compression after 61 years. There you go. Now that's a cylinder head. And there was a lot of other cool stuff too. Welcome back to Trucks and our quick little blast through history on the legendary flying fortress, the Memphis Bell. Now, I know you saw those vintage Dodges being used in that old footage that we showed you earlier. So I know you've made the connection between the truck I'm going to build and that old bomber. But before we get into the truck project, we haven't talked about the most important part of a B-17, the part that made it a fortress, the guns. All the gunners knew the, the dimensions, especially the top turret and the ball turret gun. They, their life depended on it. He didn't, you know, he didn't get off long bursts, he just short bursts. Brr, brr. Oh man, they really jumped us. And the flak opened up first, and then the fighter planes came in. And for about 45 minutes, it was all hell broke loose. As I wrecked a German planes a third time going down the line like this, the guy on this side blew up, and the other two took off. Of course, the guns the Bell was armed with was the massive 50 caliber machine gun, which could inflict incredible amounts of damage when you pulled the trigger. And the proof of the damage that the Bell inflicted is still being found today. We found a, a 50 caliber machine gun shell that was underneath the fairing around the ball turret. The excitement in this hangar was unbelievable. You find this and you realize that the last time that was used is 1942. You're the second person to touch that since 1942. That's a huge rush. So not only are the guns being restored, but all the turrets are going to be operational too. And finally, I had a chance to see if the ball turret is really as small as they say it is. <laughs> It is. All right, you're uh, in. Oh, you've got to be kidding. Now, the tail gun, oh, that was yeah. much better. There was a lot more room. The guns were more maneuverable. Hello, Chris. <laughs> this is great. Of course, at this point, it was time to start putting parts together for my truck project. So the first thing we did was check out some door handles. I found what I was looking for off an old B-52. Well, I think these two will work for us. Yeah, those are great. I think they'll polish out nice. Yeah. Nice looking pair. However, what I was really after for the Sergeant Rock project was a pair of 50 caliber machine guns. Now, this is the type of gun that would be on a Jeep or a truck or something, right? Yeah, exactly. This is a Browning uh, M2 50 caliber heavy, heavy barrel. You notice it doesn't have the cooling tubes like the bell has. Yeah, and the barrel looks longer, too. Oh, it's a lot longer gun. But this would be the proper gun to have on a truck. Oh, exactly. That's <laughs> what you want. So, how many of these do you have laying around here? Uh, I got a few. Uh-huh. <laughs> Check this out. This is awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's a little something to play with. Hell oh, yeah. <laughs> now, hopefully, this gives you an idea of just how special the Memphis Bell is. It is a national historic treasure, like the Statue of Liberty. And the cool part is, you can be part of its restoration. You can actually go down there, donate your time, and help restore the thing. Or you can donate money to help pay for it. Or if you have a business, you can donate tools and parts to help them get it done. And then, you will be part of the Memphis Bell's history. I have to tell you. That sort of opportunity comes along one time. So if you're interested, check them out at memphisbell.com or at the very least, 
make a trip to Memphis, listen to some blues, and check out that airplane. You'll be glad you did. Now, what about this truck I'm going to build and these machine guns? Well, you didn't think I was going to build a tribute to a B-17 and not put some 50 calibers on it, did you? You know me better than that. We'll be back after this. When you're building a hot performance engine, everybody knows how important the cam is. It's pretty much the heart of the engine. And comp cams build some of the very best in the business. But what about the other stuff that goes with it? You're not going to reuse that old junk, are you? No, comp cams can help you here too. They've got lifters and push rods and timing sets and two-piece timing covers. Everything to make that cam run the way it's supposed to. So if you're ready to set your valve train up right the first time with parts that are all compatible, comp cams can help you. You know, everywhere you look, it seems like there is a new additive hitting the market. Some of it is snake oil. Some of it actually does what it says it will. For example, this stuff called Protecta. Now, this is a synthetic additive. You can put it in your engine. They also have it for your transmission. And its sole purpose is to reduce friction and wear. But it's not full of a bunch of goofy stuff like wax or soap, something that will mess up your engine. This is good, solid lubricating technology. Matter of fact, Protecta is so confident in this that they offer it with an eight-year 200,000 mile warranty if you use it regularly. <laughs> that is money well spent. On today's computer controlled engines, getting a little more power out of them is actually pretty easy. All you have to do is pick up one of these super chips, Max Micro Tuners, plug it in, punch a few buttons, and whoosh, up to 10% more horsepower, up to 13% more torque if you're driving gasoline. If you're running a diesel, you can get even more than that. Now, you can also tweak things like shift points and top speed, all kinds of stuff. So, if you're finally ready to wake up that tired old computer, Super Chips is who to plug into. If you've been around performance engines at all, you know how important the distributor is and how easy it is to overlook. Well, Crane Cams has just come out with this billet distributor that you have got to take a look at. Now, the first thing that you'll notice are these exterior dials that allow you to adjust vacuum advance and mechanical advance just by turning them with a screwdriver. That is really cool. Now, it's got an optical trigger, so it's extremely accurate. There's no springs, no weights. It's entirely maintenance-free. It's waterproof, and it's at home on the street, on the trail, or even on the racetrack. Now, obviously, Crane Cams has spent a lot of time and a lot of money developing this, and that's good, because you end up with a state-of-the-art distributor.